Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. This is League Unlock. You best believe it. My name is Eric. Thank you for joining as always as we adventure on a little bit of a Han Solo episode to recap the main event of the 2023 season. MSI is fun. The World Championship was a ride, but we know the highlight of it all is the Red Bull League of their own championship. Throw another little title on there. T1 versus the very best that EU has to offer. Except for, you know, some European regional teams. But uh, obviously this was a four fun event match. Everyone, all these young players who you heard all the stories. They're fans of T1. They're fans of Faker. They have been for years as most people who have followed the competitive scene for a long time are fans of T1, are fans of Faker. And I'm going to say first and foremost, I think the event was a success. I mean, 494,000 peak viewers, which was actually the K-Corp versus T1 matchup. Again, highlighting just how massive the K-Corp fan base is, but unfortunately... When you are a huge fan base like that, sure, the numbers look great. They're going to have a massive draw in the LEC. But you also have some, I'm not going to call it toxicity. But I don't think Faker has ever been booed in his entire career. Probably his entire life. And K-Corp were booing him. I know it's a bit of a meme. They're just, no one actually dislikes Faker because you'd be absolutely insane to dislike, number one, the GOAT, the greatest face of an entire eSport, the most humble and likable dude. So Faker does not deserve any booze in the history of Everdom. Uh, but K-Corp fans, gonna K-Corp, and again, almost 500,000 peak viewers. That smashes any LCS record over the last couple of years. That's even higher than the LEC had last year in a four fun show match. So in that regard, absolute roaring success, obviously, Lots to go through when you go through these actual games. There was a bit of a mix of try hard and having some for fun. Obviously, we highlight the G2 match, the only one that T1 drops, and the EU fans roaring. The Scrim Gods return. Belveth for Yike. The dude's wrapping up, racking up 17 kills. Absolute massacre in the way of G2. This also was the last match of the day. You could tell T1 was tired. I'm sure everyone has seen the clips of Kyria and Guma literally dozing off during champ select. I can't imagine, and this is the one gripe, the one issue you could have. Could you not flesh this out for two days or something? It felt like obviously T1 as a whole were jet lagged, being the only team that really has to travel over for this event and they looked dead. They were having fun early on in the day, but you're playing you're playing a best of five essentially for T1 on a day where you're, I mean, if you've traveled across continents, you know you're slow, sluggish, just not at your best. That's what jet lag is. And these guys have to go play in front of a crowd for the better part of the day. So obviously incredibly exhausting. And add to that, this is on the tail end of an already exhausting uh, run for T1, which we'll get to in a little bit. But the G2 one, of course, EU fans have so much fun that they're able uh, to win that matchup. Some other highlights for me, obviously T1 playing with all SKT skins. Faker's got a multitude to choose from now, but you got the Zac out of owner having some fun. Faker, again, only the third professional game he's ever used the skin, and it's always these... You know, we did it at All-Stars when SKT did the same thing, all rocking their same skins. Uh, that was fun to see. Seeing some of these ERL players laughing, yucking it up, getting solo kills. Zeus was the dude having most fun in terms of pick band. We got some Vein top. We saw some Volley Bear top. Obviously, he was enjoying himself. The Vein top was, oh man, you felt so bad for Tolkien having to get absolutely massacred in that 80 carry uh, versus... 
um, obviously melee matchup for the Camille. And then you can highlight the K-Corp matchup. It wasn't upset and bow on the squad, so it was a combination of what is now going to be the LFL K-Corp and the main LEC roster. But Mr. Kalist, who we know is going to be getting promoted to the LEC as soon as he comes of age, this 1v1, 80 carry, 1v1 where Guma's playing Cho'Gath. All he has to do is press Feast when he's got about 600 health. But uh, that was a fun matchup. And again, the first few games, T1 was absolutely having fun, having a blast. Um, it was mostly troll not troll picks i mean there was some standard coming out but you got kiria popping off on caitlin support racking up double digit kills zeus as i mentioned was having a fun time fakers getting four man nico alties it was all good all entertaining although the team heretics won which was the most standard i think uh and even though there were a lot of champions removed for t1 it still looked pretty standard it was kind of slow paced compare this to the g2 one where g2 alone we're sporting a kill per minute. Team Heretics, T1, it was like nine kills in almost 30 minutes or something. It was very slow paced, felt more like an actual competitive game, which that's not what you want in these four fun event matches. You just want kills left, right, and center, which G2 luckily delivered at the end of the day, which was the lone win for them. Scrim God memes, the copium for EU, they beat T1. Of course, these are all ridiculous and not actually anything to be taken into account, but... Now you look at this thing as a whole, and by the way, they've already announced 2024, Red Bull going to be doing the same thing, but in Paris, which makes you think there's probably going to be some French regional teams, K-Corp maybe going to sport two rosters in this matchup, but overall, a good event, obviously some things you can tinker with, and the biggest loss is still just the scheduling here for T1, and you had the COO of T1, talking to Kadrill, who was co-streaming the event, and I, I couldn't even believe this when I was listening to it. T1 wins worlds. Time to celebrate. Let's party. He said six hours after they won the world championship. That's what they had for partying, and then it was right into off-season mode. They had to say, okay, well, we got to re-sign this roster. We got to negotiate contracts with Zeus, with Kyria, with blah, 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 blah. Six hours after you win worlds, Hopefully, that was longer for the players, but even for the organization, for the staff, to have to get right back into things that quickly, absolutely brutal. And then, you got a few weeks later, you're heading over to Berlin, going across a couple, oh, well, many countries, a couple continents to get there, and you're jet-lagged. The players are exhausted. Of course they are. And then he's saying at the end of the month, They've got T1 Con, which is kind of in correlation with the new year coming in, a big event for all the fans. And then usually the LCK Spring Split is starting mid-January, so roughly two weeks after that. You add all this together, and T1 for the entire calendar year, we're talking spring, going to MSI, going to the finals in both splits, going to the World Championship, winning Worlds, this Red Bull event, T1 Con, You've got less than a month of time off, basically, for the whole year, which I know in years past, we've heard from multiple SKT players saying they suffered from burnout because when you win and go to every single event, there's almost no downtime. And while you guys are playing, while you're competing, we know that these guys are playing upwards of 14 hours a day. So no kidding. These guys retired at this event and hopefully they get some kind of rest heading into the spring split because if this does become a regular uh, type of event, you know, pseudo all-stars event in between spring after Worlds, these teams that go, it can't be T1 every time. They need a break. They can't, they can't keep up with all this because it's too exhausting for them. So we're going to see how these Red Bull events uh, continue because, again, the Paris one, Sounds like it's going to be Red Bull again, but the viewership number should make, should draw an eyebrow raise from Riot saying, okay, people do want this. Maybe we can either collaborate a little bit more with Red Bull to make these events even bigger, include more teams, maybe have some players from other regions coming in or whatever, make the spectacle bigger, make it a whole weekend. So, when a team like T1 has to fly all the way from Korea to Germany, they're there for more than a day. Because again, COO said, 
next day, we're out of here. It's like a 48-hour whirlwind that they come in, play five games against all these EU teams, and then fly them all the way back to Korea. And time to get ready for scrims for spring split, boys, because as you know, spring starts, okay, mid-January, but teams are scrimming like a month before that. Most of the rosters are already finalized in the LCK. I wouldn't be surprised if you've already got teams scrimming. Kespa Cup happens in a couple of weeks. Where is the break? Where is the downtime? Where is the time for Faker to sit down by the fire and read some books and just relax with his fourth world championship? Hardly seems like there's any time, and that right there is just... The, the consequences of success, which is something T1 and the SKT organization is oh too familiar with. But you look at from the EU side of things and big thumbs up for the event. The fans absolutely loved it. I loved having a streamer centric uh, team that ended up getting completely smashed. But actually, it was closer than thought. But a, a lot of these personalities get to play against Faker, get to play against T1. So overall, two thumbs up. Just feel just feel bad for T1 and the absolutely ludicrous schedule that the players have had throughout all of 2023 and really throughout the entire history of the org. A little bit more T1 action. The rumor is not a rumor anymore. It is official. T1 announcing Reckless joining their academy squad with a little video. Obviously, he's already in Korea. He's already with the team. And you know what? The more... I think about, the more I hear about this move, the more excited I am, the more into it I am. Mad respect to Reckless for kind of, it's almost like a reset for his career. And in this video, he talked about swapping to support as something he considered even in 2014. That's a decade ago, which would be absolutely insane. Obviously, he became one of the best 80 carries of all time in Europe, but the fact that he's doing this at the later stages of his career on a challenger team, the opportunity to go to the most storied organization and what he talked about and has talked about, learning. Just learning from all the other players in T1, the Premier League, whether it's the A team that are the defending world champions or even the academy team and how the system works within what is probably the most well-run organization in a new role there's going to be so many growing pains and learning curves for Reckless, speaking a totally different language, a completely a culture shock, a totally different way to play the game, and just a way to live. But I'm excited for him, and honestly, it's probably a win-win because he's going to draw some attention to the Academy team for T1. I know T1 doesn't need a boost in fan base, but... The LCK Challenger and Academy team does because most people don't really care about that. Getting a big personality like Reckless there, people will care about. And hopefully, Reckless is thinking a year uh, with T1 Challengers. Maybe he comes back to the LEC and there's a starting spot waiting for him after he's grinded through the gauntlet that is the LCK and can become, you know, a solid support in the LEC. There's, there's so many now different role swaps from AD carry to support that we've seen, Core JJ, Sven are the two ones that initially jump out, who he did it from mid to support, and you know, to varying degrees of success, but a lot of these guys have become legitimate premier all pro level support players after doing this role swap. And I'm excited to see the growth for Reckless in that role, the growth for him as I mean it's gonna be hard to be a shot caller on a T1 roster where everyone's speaking Korean, but it's honestly probably going to improve your communication skills even more when you can't communicate in the same language very well. Uh, they've also, they're bringing back Poby, so the memes will live on. I hope this guy actually has a good year because he got so flamed, thrown under the bus during that 1-7 and seven stretch for T1. Let's see him. He's still... Have faith in T1 developing some of these young players. Have faith in him continuing to grow. He's never going to be under the pressure cooker to the level that he was with that T1 uh, 1 and 7 run. So excited he got another opportunity. Wasn't just thrown to the wayside by the T1 organization. And for the first time in the history of ever, I'm going to tune in to some LCK Academy and watch 
T1. See how reckless is. See how the squad is. What ends up being um, the rest of that roster. And maybe, just maybe, because of the absolutely nutty, insane schedule that T1 has had, maybe they get a week or two off in the middle of the spring split. That's the time to do it. What's the difference to T1? Maybe they finish second or third in the playoffs. It doesn't matter. Give Kiri and the boys some time off and let Big Daddy Reckless pop into that starting LCK lineup for the most storied franchise in the history of the LCK. LCK, LEC, LCS, offseason stuff seems to be behind us, but the LPL is slogging a little bit behind a lot of these rosters. We're still running on rumors, not fully confirmed yet. Some of the big boys are a little bit more confirmed, but we continue to have some slow rumors Going through the latest and greatest, we're hearing that the World Elite roster is finalized and it is a familiar face, not to the LPL, but to the pro scene, third region in three years for Mr. Prince. Going from Live Sandbox in the LCK to FlyQuest in the LCS, now joining World Elite alongside Fofo in this new revamped WE lineup. We've seen Shanks on there for so long. Wayward's coming over uh, from TES. I think Prince is a mysterious one because that first split, first split in a bit with FlyQuest, it looked like he was completely smurfing on an entire region. Looked like he didn't deserve to be here because he was so leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else until Berserker ended up having his number. But I, I think the fall off for Prince, a lot of it was just related to the debacle, absolute mess that ended up being FlyQuest in 2023 with that, what should have been star-studded roster. So I have no question in my mind that he can get back to an incredibly high level. I want, he's a pretty damn good support in the LPL, obviously, as is always gonna be the case when you're importing over to the LPL communication issues might be something but you don't need to talk much as an 80 carry just sit there farm cs and pop off in team fights and prince is more than capable of doing just that so i'm hoping and expecting a resurgence out of him because you know he just wants to win you know he's going to be extra motivated after that down year in the lcs and i'm excited to see him back on the rift Top Esports, we've talked about their roster a little bit. The core looks settled, but now we know that Mark is out. That support position has been the spot that's kind of been tentative. Who's going to be going there? I've seen multiple names linked potentially to joining the latest one. We're seeing Mako over from ADG, EDG to be paired up with Jackie Love potentially. I think the rest, the top four, 369, Tian, Cream, Jackie Love, that's all but locked in uh, for this squad support. I mean, if Mako comes in, he'll, first off, he'll have played with Uzi and Jackie Love in back-to-back -back splits, arguably the two LPL goats when it comes to 80 carries. But, I mean, Mako didn't have a great year last year, but you talk about leadership for Mako and Tien, shot calling and controlling how the game goes, and top esports' biggest issue going back to the peak with Knight was the macro. They didn't know how to move around a map. They didn't know how to control the game. Mako is maybe the best of all time when it comes to controlling the game. Even when mechanically or individually he's not playing at the highest level, that is always something you can count on. Can he reel in Jackie Love? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you don't want to because honestly, 2023, he had some of the best highlights he's had in a highlight-filled career. But if it is Mako who ends up getting thrown in here, obviously Ming we've heard would also be fantastic. If it's one of these old guard best supports of all time, Jackie Love, what a pairing. Best support he's had probably ever. And this, that's a, that's a dark horse. Maybe not so much a dark horse. This should be a top four team for top esports with a legitimate shot at maybe, just maybe, taking home an LPL crown. Obviously, JDG, BLG is still gonna be absolutely lethal on the Rift. LNG uh, as well with, you know, Weiwei Wei coming over and the rest of the roster pretty much being the same. It's, it's definitely gonna be a very different looking LPL season, but don't ever sleep on this region as a whole. I feel like just, Last year, we were saying, well, JDG looks great, but 
There's no one else who's really that good. And then all of a sudden, BLG ascend to new heights. LNG outperforms all expectations. And somehow, Weibo Gaming is going to the World Championship. And that's where the next rumor we talk about is because we're hearing that the shy is stepping away for at least the spring split to take some time to rest, recharge. Haven't heard this from him officially. Also, maybe felt like he underperformed at Worlds. We're taking that out of context from a third party. Don't know if he actually feels that way. I feel that way. He underperformed in the World Finals, of course. But obviously, that's a shame because he is one of... Nay, he is the most exciting player in the LPL to watch. Understand him needing to take away, step away, take a break. Hopefully, he comes back for summer. I can't just see him fading into retirement after just making it to the World Finals for the second time in his career with a upstart surprise Weibo gaming performance. Don't know what the replacement is going to be for Weibo or fully what this roster is going to be looking like. I, I they lose Weiwei. I don't remember who's coming in. It's their jungle potentially. It's you know we're like a month from the LPL season kicking off and there's still a lot of question marks for a lot of these rosters. Yes, there's rumors, but the confirmation isn't there yet. Teams are probably starting scrim soon and much like the Kespa Cup, you know, the Demacia Cup's gonna be getting started soon. So let's let's get going LPL. We gotta see what some of these finalized rosters are gonna be. Be a shame if the Shies are not there. Potentially another young top laner gets to step in and fill the void for Weibo with Xiaohu Light in the gang, but excited to see who they pick either way. And hopefully the Shy returns for the summer split. Because again, if this guy continues to play and reach the highs that he is capable of, there's no question he's going to be going down as a top one, two, at worst three top laner in the history of the game. He's probably already at that point, honestly. But before we, eventually we're going to do a full preview or at least, you know, rank the top teams in the LPL in some kind of tier list. But man, we need, we need these rosters to be finalized. We need these rumors to become confirmations and we're still rate, waiting on the rest of the LPL to be getting that done. But I assure you, whenever it happens, Mark and I will be here to break it all down for you. But that is it today, you wonderful people of this wonderful planet. Thank you for gracing us with your presence and hanging out with us day in and day out. We really do appreciate it. And until next time, we will catch you on the flippity flip.